Let's uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Continuing our thoughts of uh, being uh, looking at Paul as uh, he prayed. One of the uh, titles, I guess, for this particular prayer is praying for weaker brothers. And uh, Church of Corinth certainly had its uh, problems. We'll talk about that there in just a moment. First Corinthians. I want to read verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and 8, maybe 9. We're just going to mostly focus on 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be the apostle of the Lord through the will of God and so these our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ called to be saints. I underline the word saint. With all uh, who in every place call on the name of the Lord, are, uh, call on the, on the name of Christ Jesus our Lord for both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in every uh, thing by Him in all utterances or speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you uh, could you uh, you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are also called in the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Dear Father, we come to you tonight, Lord. Uh, uh, looking here, uh, it seems like we'll get to, to delve into every uh, uh, parts of every epistle that Paul has written through this study, Lord. So we just pray that we would be able to uh, uh, be mindful of, uh, of the things that seem to repeat and, uh, and be blessed by what you have to say in the middle of all of it, Lord. Lord, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that uh, so far uh, the old Roman and Rock and the preacher uh, has been kept at bay. And I, I appreciate that, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that uh, your grace is sufficient, Lord in our needs. So just uh, watch over us tonight, Lord. Thank you for those who are here, Lord. And uh, may our habits become your habits. Lord. In Jesus' name, or may your habits become our habits. That would be better. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So Corinth is one of the most important uh, cities in, in Greece uh, during Paul's day. It had been rebuilt and uh, it uh, stood there as a, a pinnacle of uh, of a great city almost close to Rome. Uh, Paul had spent some 18 months there preaching and it had been about three years since he had uh, left there and uh, many things had happened, many people had come through. Uh, but somebody had written Paul a letter overall saying, hey, there's some things going on here. And Paul begins to look at that and begins to write and address some of the problems that were presented to him in this book. And... Uh, Corinthians, the church of Corinth's problem uh, was uh, what happens to a lot of churches uh, throughout history and even, even today when we live. It is that the church of Corinth was very socially advanced. They had a lot of philosophy. They had a lot of worldly things going in. And uh, the people who were being saved, uh, though Paul calls them saints, uh, they were not very mature and they stayed kind of in an immature stunned growth state so that uh, the world was coming in to the church and, and uh, things were happening uh, that uh, just shouldn't be happening. I was reminded one more time this week, earlier in the week, that uh, Christians, church, local congregations, do things God's way, right? God has a certain way that He does things, a certain way that He intends things to happen, and that's why we do it. 
Uh, that's why uh, uh, I've always said and, and have been a, a believer of this my whole life that uh, how God's church is funded is that God's people give an offering plate. And that's how God funds it. We don't uh, set up rocking events, right? We don't sit there and, and, uh, and, and raffle off shotguns and rifles. I mean, that, the VFW can do that and, and uh, the, the nursing home can do those kind of things. Your local school board can do those kind of things. Uh, they can sell candy and and cookies and everything for fundraisers, but, but God's church doesn't do that. And that's just my example of how what it means to do something God's way. Uh, but these people had, had taken to bring those idolatrous and cultural uh, degraded things that were going on in and around them in the city of Corinth, and they brought it into the church. So what happens when it happens? Well, the church of Corinth was defiled because of it. Some of its members were living in sexual immorality, uh, so they were defiled. Some of them got drunk. Still others used the grace of God to excuse a worldly living, so it was also a divided church with at least four different groups competing for leadership. Uh, I think that we can find that over in verse 12 of chapter 1. Uh, now I say this, each of you said, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas or Peter. Or I am of Christ, right? So, you know, I, I follow the, the person Paul. I follow the, the teaching of Peter. I follow the, Paul, uh, the teaching of Apollos. And then you have the super, super spiritual folks in church. I just do what Jesus says, right? And so they were, they were a divided church in their leadership. And they were always competing for who would lead the church by, by whatever teacher uh, they thought was important. It also meant, because of all this, it was a disgraced church. You can't be defiled, drunk, and divided and say you have a strong fellowship. It was a disgraced church, which instead of glorifying God, uh, um, it was hindering uh, the progress of the gospel, right? Who, who wants to go to church with those people? So Paul uh, calls them all saints, not mature saints. But they're rich people there, they're slaves, they're poor, they're barbarians, they're Scythians. He calls them all saints. And that, that's great. Because that's how God sees us, right? If we have been saved by Christ, one of the benefits there is, of course, is salvation, and that we are changed from sinners to saints, no matter where we are on the line of progression. So Paul begins to pray. And we've seen some of this prayer before. It says, I thank my God, right? Again, a very personal relationship. Uh, this church is mostly made up of, of Gentiles. This is a real Gentile church, not a very big Jewish element in it. So uh, they didn't quite understand, just like the Jews didn't quite understand, that, uh, that uh, God was a very personal God. They used to sacrifice to idols. And, and what you did to them, you didn't give them thanksgiving offerings or or, or, or peace offerings, you gave them offerings to, to keep them from getting mad about something. So their gods were distant and far off and angry and very vengeful. And, and so they didn't have an intimate relationship with their, their gods. Think about uh, those Greek gods and Roman gods that, that they served, right? The Zeus and, and Athena and all those people. All they were were, 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 were in large deities that had a lot of flaws in them, a lot of human flaws in them. Uh, so they weren't there. But Paul says, I thank my God. And remember we talked about he was a God, Paul's God because of eternal election, a sovereign eternal election. Somewhere in eternity past, God called Paul to be one of his children. And then in time, God gave Paul to Christ, right? There on the road to Damascus, Jesus met him there. And uh, Paul surrenders to him and gets to work for him. So he's there by sovereign eternal election. He's there by redemption. Again, Christ died for him, redeemed him out of the slave market of sin, and uh, set him out of that and, and made him whole. He's also here because of regenerative power, right? The, the regenerating power of the Spirit of God. Because Christ redeemed him, he was deposited inside of him the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was there to guide and teach him and, and help him along and and, uh, and, and control his life and, 
and uh, fill him with uh, all kind of confidence, uh, all kind of confidence, and and wisdom, and and spiritual gifts. And uh, he was also placed there as a, a, a deposit, an earnest, a guarantee that there was going to be a fulfillment. That because the Spirit of God was resting inside of Paul, Christ one day would come and, and not only reunite his spirit and soul, but also take his body and he would live bodily, a, a supernatural body, mind, body, and spirit in heaven one day. So he's personal God. And then I like the word always. I underline my and I underline always. But this is very interesting, right? I thank my God always. Why always? Well, think about this. He had been there for 18 months. He preached, taught, built him up. He left three and a half years. Obviously, other people, Paul starts the church. Other people come in, like the lawyer, Apollos comes in and, and it's a teacher there for a little while. Even Peter, Cephas, comes in for a little while and is a teacher there for a little while. Some people get spiritual and, and come in from other sections and they say, we're of Christ. So there have been many teachers come in. And Paul says, I love you always. Because in the time that Paul had left, they were here. And when he's writing them, they're there. So the things that changed in the church of Corinth was not for the best. They were, had not matured at all. And Paul looks at him and says, I, I thank my God always for you. That is, whatever state you are, if you are in a stunned growth or you're maturing, if you're getting it right or you're getting wrong, I still think of all of you as saints of God and I'll always see you in that light. Right? Paul sees them. He understands the trouble they have. He's going to try to address the trouble they had, but he, he always sees them as children of God. I, I think that's where we ought to start out, right? That no matter... Uh, no matter what the, the, the condition of our people are, if, if we believe that they're Christians, then that's how we ought to start dealing with one another. We shouldn't think the worst of everybody, even though they may not be as mature as we are. Uh, sometimes uh, growing in Christ takes time, right? It really does. So when we meet people, we're not in it. We're, we're considering them as saints, and we should treat them that way. So Paul says, I'm treating you as saints. Always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. So, the grace of God. So, what is one of the first benefits of the grace of God? Well, one of the first benefits of the grace of God, we already talked about it, is salvation. That's one of the first benefits that God's unmerited favor gives us is salvation. But He's not just talking about unmerited favor here. He really gets to talk about the gifts, the graces that God gives His people. He's going to talk about how they're, they're, they're full of all kind of spiritual gifts. And, and he's interested in how they use the gifts. Remember, they were supposed to use those gifts to, to be generous with one another and help one another grow as Christians. Uh, they had taken these, these spiritual gifts that were meant to build up the church and they went and played with them like they were toys in a sandbox, you know. And they were always trying to take their gifts home, right? And it's kind of like if you the only person that's got a football and you get mad. Um, and all the other cousins, you say, I'm just going to take my little football and go home. Fine, we'll play with a pine cone. We don't like you anyway. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sometimes I have flashbacks. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, it's that. And they were always taking these gifts and they were, they had elevated some gifts and they had decreased other gifts. And, and the gifts that they elevated uh, Paul says we're not the most important gifts to have. I, I, again, I, I've read that before over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, he talks about us earnestly desire, uh, chapter 12, verse 31, uh, to earnestly desire the best gifts, right? What are the best gifts? As far as Paul's concerned, it was not speaking in tongues, but it was being the, the teacher and an evangelist and and those kind of prophets and those kind of things, that, that was the best gift. And Paul earnestly desired that they would get a hold of those kind of things instead of the flashy showing, speaking in tongues and, and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, the benefit that Paul's talking here, and the benefit that God's thanking, uh, 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 Paul's thanking God for is the spiritual gifts that he has deposited within that church. Now they're not using them right, but Paul is is thanking God that there are spiritual gifts in that church. Uh, again, uh, everything it takes to, to make this happen for them. Um, 
Verse 7 of chapter 12 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So each of us, at the moment of salvation, not only has a grace of being saved, but we are given a spiritual gift or a series of spiritual gifts, right? Uh, here he begins to list some of them. He says, For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gift of healing by the same Spirit, to another working through miracles, and another prophecy, and another discerning of spirits, another different kind of tongues, another interpretation of tongues. But the same Spirit works in all the Spirit to each one individually as He wills. So we don't really, we don't really get a say because we don't really know what our local church body needs, right? Does our local church body need a prophet? Well, then God sends that prophet into that. Does the local church body need a pastor? Well, you know, in other places, that's a spiritual gift. Well, God put a pastor in this church. Right? I used to be a preacher. I really did. When I, God saved me and I, 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 I began to preach uh, when I was 19 or 18 or however long ago that was, I, all I think, when I finally decided that God wanted me to be a preacher, I said, Lord, at least make it interesting when I preach. I didn't know what I was praying, but it certainly been interesting as I preached for the years. So I answered that prayer. But as I, as I preached, I told you this before, as I preached, I, I realized that people really don't need a preacher. Though I'm, I'm, I, I believe that's one of my gifts is, is preaching and teaching. What people really need is a pastor, a shepherd, an under-shepherd, under Christ. So he's put that there. What, what does the church need? Does it, does it need somebody who is good at helps or administration or, or those kind of things? Those are the people he brings in. It's like we were talking about the other night. When somebody joins our church, when God graciously puts them in our church, we need to find out what their spiritual gift is and then we need to try to nurture that spiritual gift. We, we don't explore that near about enough as a Baptist church. And, and I can see if we were a big old church and we didn't know one another, uh, that we might not be able to get intimate enough with one another to figure out what God really wants to do in our life. But we're a small church. We ought to be able, when God puts somebody in our congregation, to find out what the spiritual gift that they have and try to make sure if, if, if their spiritual gift is teaching, then what we need to do is try to find some way to make that person teach. Now, you can, you can be a gifted teacher, but that may not be your spiritual gift, right? We can do a lot of things by nature. Some people are very talented singers, but I don't see any more guys gives you spiritually in sin. I mean, I, I read this. 36 of them listed in four different places. In here. There's no spiritual gift of sin, but there's certainly a lot of talented people who can sing and be a blessing, right? There's a lot of people who are talented teachers, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're spiritually gifted to do it. So we find that spiritual gift that they operate in and try to move in those people in the areas that it works. You know, some people are, are very good at at, at, at helps, administration, keeping all the wheels on the bus and keeping the, 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 uh, the, the desserts, grease and that kind of stuff. We need to put those in those places where they can keep the oil pumping in the place. We need those people in those places. We, we need people who are evangelists, right? Uh, one of the things that I pray for all the time in my own personal life because I can ask for it, because I desire the best gifts is, is to, to be more evangelistic. Not just evangelistic in the sermon, because that's easy to do, but personally in an evangelist. So that people might say, you know what? Uh, our two preachers always tell about people about Jesus. You know, everywhere he goes, not only does he have the, the light in his life shining, but he's also talking about Christ everywhere he goes, and, and people are being saved. The only problem with that is you really are a real good personal evangelist. People hate you. Oh, no. No, no, I no. All he's going to do is talk about Jesus, you know. Yeah, he's a nice enough guy, but that uh, guy, but that Jesus. Talk. Anyway, so he's, he's thanking God for all the specific individual graces or gifts or charismatic kind of things that are placed, charisma that is placed in that church. And he said it was, I underlined the word given because there's also another word I'm, I want to talk about here. So first of all, these these spiritual gifts are given, right? We talked about the Spirit of God gives them and puts them there and to the profit of all of us. We can't just take our gifts home. We're supposed to use it to manifest and, and make things happen in other people's lives. I don't want to overdo this. I'm going to try to move on. Uh, and who gives them? 
blood is Christ Jesus. Why is it? Because it's His body. It's His church. He knows what needs to be there. And Paul says, I can thank Christ that the right spiritual gifts are there and He knows what He's got in that church and He knows what He's working with in that church. He knows what that church wants to do. And he says, I can thank God for that. Y'all are weaker. You're not very mature. I'm going to have to deal with the sexual immorality. I'm going to have to deal with the drunkenness. I'm going to have to deal with the worldliness. And I'm going to have to deal with the division. I'm going to have to remind you that all these things cause you to dim your life and that you're a disgraceful church. But I want you to know something. Christ has everything there it takes for you to get over every bit of this stuff and really be something special in your community. Verse 5. So what is the thing? That you were enriched, right? That word enriched is where we get our English word plutocrat. P L U T O C R A T E. It means a very rich person. Yeah. I didn't know that. I just had to throw that up there. I could have just left that out, but that's what we get. He says, I think that God has given you, I think Christ Jesus that He has given you all these spiritual gifts and have done it in a rich manner. You are you are enriched in everything by Him. Think about what that means. You again, as a church of Corinth, have everything it takes to be a wonderful, effective, shining light, beating on the hill, sitting not here, uh, a candle, uh, sitting on a, on a lamp stand, not here on a basket. You have everything it is because God's enriched you. But think about this. If God has done this for some people, He'll do it for others, right? Other churches, that's how God builds His church. He puts what He needs in that church so that they're enriched to accomplish what they're supposed to accomplish inside that community. That's what you do. You think, well, we don't have this. No, God has, has through Christ Jesus gifted us with spiritual gifts and uh, the right people and the right mix of people are the right mix of people who will come in, right, to, to carry out His mission. Paul says, I thank Him for that. And I, and I said, right, and I thank God for for you and, and, and your spiritual gifts and, and what God does through you to, 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 to ease over the humps or to, 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 to meet the, the, the problems head on. I, I'm not, I, I do not like conflict. I'm not very good at it. And uh, uh, there are other people who are, are, are conflict enjoyers. I look at, I look at stuff and I, I always do this and I've said this before. And I told this to a younger nurse one time. You go down that hall, and when I'm talking about the hall, it's the hall I've worked in. It's the hall I've been in for 15 and a half years. You go down that hall, and you've got two buckets. One of them's got water in it, and one of them's got gas. You have to make a decision by the time you get down to that room and walk in that door, which one you fix to throw on that fire. I don't want to fool with gas. I'm over water. But you still need some people who can handle the gas. Then I come around and try to do the rest of it. But uh, not, nobody in particular, nothing bad. I'm just making the example that takes every bit of that to work and, and God enriches us. So He has enriched us or made us very rich or very wealthy. We're plutocrats. And everything by Him. Again, He is the one who is setting the pace. He's the one who knows what the church needs. In all utterances and knowledges, chapter 12 and chapter through chapter 14, Paul is talking about the things that they really want. They really were, were, were set up on those showy gifts. They wanted to speak in tongues. I don't know if the gift of tongues is still operating in this world or not. I, I know that those people at Corinth just really... Uh, they said, if you weren't speaking in tongues, you don't really have a spiritual gift, right? You run into some uh, uh, charismatics or some Pentecostals who, uh, who uh, you know, you live for Christ your whole life in a sacrificial, humble servant, growing the Word, you know, and uh, they meet you somewhere, and they, if you wearing a mustache, uh, they're mad at you. If you don't speak in tongues, you don't know Jesus, and you need a second blessing. I'm telling you, when you say that's all, but you get everything. You 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 like being born in this world uh, fully fit. That may not be mature, but you have everything. When you're born, you have two arms, two legs, right? Two eyes, two ears. You know, and in theory, it all should work perfectly. Now, it may need to grow, but you have it. When you're born in Christ, 
He puts everything there, and you may need to grow into it, but He does not leave you a warning or chance, and you don't have to go back and, and to ask for a second gifting, right? That's just ignorance. Stupid. I'm a biblical. I got to stop. Ah. So he said that all utterances and knowledge. Now think about this. One of the problems that were happening in the community is they wasn't getting their message across. Apostle Paul says he's gifted you in getting your message across. All utterances. My little center call reference says speech. So in all speech, he's gifted and enriched you, made you very wealthy. You're a bunch of proof plutocrats. As far as the speech of God and in knowledge, you have exactly what you need to know to get out in that community and accomplish what you need to accomplish. Again, if Christ does that for them, He does that for us. Well, Brother Tony, I don't know what to say. You have been gifted by the Spirit of God, given to by Christ Jesus Himself, to know exactly what to say. Well, Brother Tony, I don't have the ability to come up with that knowledge. I'm telling you, there is knowledge that has been gifted to you by the Spirit of God to handle whatever situation you're in. And you may have to go digging for it, but I'm telling you it's available to you, and it's promised that if you're in a, in a tight spot and, 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 and need it, God will bring these very words to remember it for you so that He'll tell you what you need to say. The problem is you've got to get it in before you can get it out, right? Okay. But they've been gifted with that. God gifts us with that. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, it's here. God's gifted you. And Paul's thanking God that they're able to do that and God's gifted that to them. These are weaker brothers and yet they have everything that it takes for them to pull themselves out of being divisive and despised and, and divided. Uh, which is the same thing as decisive. Uh, and defiled and being disgraced. They have everything. There's nothing that's needed. All they got to do is get their act together. And God thanks them that He's put everything there, the seed element of everything it takes. Alright, so it was given to you, and verse 6 says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Right? So it was given to you, and now you have the testimony of Christ. What is the testimony of Christ? That He has changed your life. The things that you used to desire in your old nature, you no longer desire because He's made you a new creature in Christ. Well, Tony, I don't know about all that. Well, that's what 2 Corinthians is all about. Chapter 5 talks about all that. Talks about uh, um, verse 17 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Christ Jesus and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. What are we doing? We're trying to get people to God and we have the testimony of Christ. What do you need to get a hold of people? You need the testimony of Christ that is confirmed in you. It's not just something you talk about, but it's something that has changed inside of you and Christ Himself confirms it. How does He confirm it? He confirms it by giving you a new nature and placing in you His Spirit. You know something's changed. You know if you go back to doing those things you used to do before you were saved, you know it's wrong. You say, well, that's my conscience. No, that's the Spirit of God uh, putting His foot where it needs to go to get you out of whatever you were doing. Whatever immoral thing, whatever thing that controlled you. If you were uh, a drunk, if you were controlled by liquor, you're supposed to be controlled by the Spirit of God. So if you go back to drinking, the Spirit of God saying, hey, you don't... You don't, you don't need that anymore. I remember this uh, older lady, and this is not quite the same thing, but this older lady, my uncle, he loved to dip snuff, right? I dipped those big red man's shoes, and he would swallow the juice every once in a while. He never hardly ever spit. And he got where he was very nauseated for it, right? Very nauseated. And one day he was talking to a group, and one of the ladies said, well, I'm so glad to hear that. I've been praying that God would take that filthy habit away from you. And he said, you need to stop. You just don't know how much, how good that red man in the back of you is. Uh, but, you know, the whole idea is that God doesn't let us stay in that field. He cleans us up. So that's the confirming testimony. Verse 7, so that you come short in no gift. He said, well, we're lacking something. We're lacking something. We're not going to be able to do that. No, the testimony of Christ that He saved your life is confirmed in you by His Spirit. And you don't lack anything. 
You can handle whatever it takes to get the world out of your church. Right? One of the gifts is the gifts of faith. I don't know if we're going to be able to do that unless we sell raffle tickets. I'm telling you, come short no spiritual gift. You can trust that God is able to take care of His church while they're resorting to, to selling cookies on the side. You just believe that. You'll come not short of it. Well, Brother Tony, I don't think we have enough, enough teachers in church. Well, somebody just has need to step up. What's one I can't do? It. No, you've been given all knowledge and all others. You need to step up and, and be the teacher. How hard it is uh, in the last eight years of constantly trying to get people together with people, quit people, die people, go on. People, yeah, but some people come in. We can't access those people. They don't come to. I, I don't know what's going on. They need to get right with Jesus and, and, and get their parts when it comes time to be the teacher or when it comes time to. Uh, to, to be the deacon or it comes time to, to, to join this community or that community that they just step up and say you know what God's gifted me in that and I want to participate in that and let me go at it and somebody said well you haven't been a member long enough I'm telling you what you just go on and get a hold of that anyway and start pulling it right well you've got to wait a year well fine whatever that's fine that's one way you ought to prove yourself but if you want to do something you're not going to make this preacher stop you from doing it have the Spirit of God leading you to do it. You're just not going to make me do it. I'm going to sit up there laying me into it. Mm -hmm. and I'll just be doing my kids and say, go for it. Go for it. But I've had to tell people in this very church, he said, you don't understand uh, what I'm saying here when I say something. Said, I've got to move with the people to move. <laughs> if I'm waiting for, for the people who ain't moving to move, we're never going to move. So if somebody's moving, if somebody's getting spiritual, somebody wants to do something, it, we may not be going through all of the processes and all the committees and all the things that weigh us down because we're not lean. But I mean, I know what the purpose of some of that stuff is. But we don't we don't want to lose all the old and just because something new it may not be right. But I'm telling you something. If somebody comes up to me and says, "Brother, I want to do this, this, and this," and you look at me and I'm, I'm looking at you and I'm, and you just know. I told the person. I said, "Look, you know what's going to happen. We've been around each other long enough." You know what's going to happen if somebody tells me they want to do something for God. So if you want to stop it, you better stop it when the conversation is going right then and not three weeks down the road when we've got something going on. Because I'm going to move with who's moving. Why is that, Brother Tony? Because I believe God's confirming His testimony in that and these people aren't going to come up short because they've been blessed with the Spirit of God and they'll come up short in nothing that they're doing. So that you come up short and no gift, eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the, what's the benediction here? What's the end of the prayer? It is that we want to see Jesus. We want to see Him revealed in our life now. We want to see Him when He comes back from glory. We want to be raised up from the dead if we're in the grave. We want to see Jesus moving in our church, Paul says. That's what it's all about, the revelation of Christ Jesus. How will we reveal Him in our church? We'll see His gifts working because we're enriched in those things. And people are moving in that power with that purpose. And things are happening. Verse 8, who will confirm, will also confirm you to the end. Right? So He doesn't just start. The spiritual process is a growth process so He takes you from the time, the day you're saved, the time He carries you on, and He's continuing reconfirming Himself. I think Christ is going to let me down. Well, Paul says, Paul, God, Christ is not going to let you down. He's going to continue to confirm that He's working in your life. That you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What day is that? The day He comes back to get us to the Lord. We're going to be wild spot and wild women. Well, brother, I've got a long way to go. Well, then you can expect that you won't die anytime soon. Because he's going to keep working on you until you have a place he can carry you home safely. So he can present you to his father as a bride. Why is he able to do that? Because God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Why is he able to do that? Because God is faithful. He does not give up. He does not run away. He doesn't just cut tail on him because it gets tough. He doesn't cut tail on him because the church looks a little worldly. He doesn't cut the church and run because folks are mad at each other about the color of the, of the carpet or the pew or what side of the end. He does not cut and run because of that. He is faithful. He intends to bring us together in unity, confirming us in the testimony of His Son and giving us 
uh, gifts in which will not come short in, so that his knowledge and glory can cover the, the earth as waters cover the sea. It's a little bit of Isaiah 30. Amen. Amen. That's all I know about this. <laughs>